emphasis on the last days. However, dispensationalists believe, and I believe they, they're correct, that they correspond to somewhat overlapping but basically consecutive periods of church history. The first, Ephesus, the Ephesian age, corresponding to the first century apostolic church, the church of uh, Smyrna, the persecuted church, Pergamum, the patristic church, Thyatira, the church of the Middle Ages, Sardis, the church of the Reformation, Philadelphia is of course uh, the, the revivalist and the mission churches, and then the last one is Laodicea. With this in view, look with me please to Revelation chapter 3, the message to the church of Laodicea commencing in the 14th verse. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I advised you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. I sob to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and correct. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now the metaphor for nakedness here speaks of gnezo in Greek, but it's the Hebrew concept of not having the garments of salvation. There's people in this church who are never really truly saved. Laodicea is a name of a church, and we have to understand about these seven churches. Some aspect of the way the Lord Jesus appeared in the first chapter of Revelation is highlighted in his message to each church. Some aspect of the way he appeared is highlighted in his message to each church. But additionally, the Greek names of these churches indicate something about their character. The Greek names indicate something about their character. Laodicea is a compound term, it's one word, but it's a compound term, from Laodicea. Leo de KMI. Is there a way to get these front lights out so that people can see this better, perhaps for the filming? Leo de KMI, people's opinions. It could also be translated people's rights. I had the right to my opinion. That is the way the last church will be. The seventh church, the final church before Jesus comes, before the events leading up to the Great Tribulation happen, will be a church run by people's opinions. We have multiple references to Laodicea in the Old Testament. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. The Antichrist will destroy many while they were at ease. Laodicea's first problem is it doesn't know it's Laodicea. By sob to anoint your eyes that you may see. They are blind to their true spiritual state. Some of them don't even have the garments of salvation. Laodicea doesn't know that's who it is. Quite a situation. Part of the reason is not just that they're lazy, but they have lost their zeal, their enthusiasm, their first love, but that they judge by the world's standards. They make the world's standards the barometer of blessing. The world puts a price tag on everything. Because you're prospering financially or materially, therefore that becomes the indicator of God's blessing in their thinking. This is exactly what we see with the Televangelists who've made born again a household joke by discrediting and undermining the gospel. They use the world standards to judge. That becomes their barometer, money. We must be all right. God's blessing us materially. In fact, when we read the seven churches, it was poor and struggling churches, persecuted churches like Smyrna and churches like Philadelphia who were spiritually rich. They judge by the world's standards. It is not the material affluence itself that's the problem. It's their attitude towards it. They don't know they are Laodicea. People's opinions, people's views permeate the church in the last days. They lose their biblical basis or their biblical focus in determining what the church should be and what its ministry should be. It becomes a church run on the ideas of men. Leo the Kaomai. And they think they have their right to this. 
we have to understand something about worldviews. I'd like to introduce you to two concepts. One is recontextualize and the other is redefine. Recontextualize or redefine. Whenever you have a change in worldview or when you bring the gospel into a new culture to where the gospel is alien, you have a challenge. How do you communicate those truths to people who don't have your worldview? They see things differently. When the Wycliffe translators went to a certain place in tribal Africa, in equatorial Africa, to a certain tribe who had no concept of snow, didn't know what it was, they never saw it, they translated Isaiah 118, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as coconut. They simply recontextualized the meaning until the people were able to understand what snow was, then they changed it to snow eventually. But they wanted people to understand how Jesus makes us white and so forth, and they didn't know what snow was, so they had a problem. There's always a problem when the worldview changes when you go to another worldview. Biblically, we're supposed to do what St. Paul did when he took the gospel to the Greeks and Romans, to the Greco-Roman world. He recontextualized. In other words, he changed the package, not what was in it. He changed the packaging, not what was in it. When he debated the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill in the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17, he took a concept that would have been known only to Jews at that point a Jewish gospel of a Jewish Messiah, and now he's explaining it to Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in the Areopagus, the Areopagites. He didn't change the meaning, however. He simply took the gospel and he recontextualized it. He presented it in a context that Greeks could understand it. This is recontextualization. Purely biblical. The problem becomes when instead of recontextualizing the gospel, people redefine it. They change its meaning. This will always happen when there's a change in worldview. You can always argue what came first, the chicken or the egg. So arbitrarily, just for the sake of brevity, let's say you had a change in science. A change in science will cause a change in technology. Change in technology will cause a change in economy. Economic change will cause social and cultural change. Then there will be a political change. Political changes. You'll wind up with a new worldview. Well, let's see how this could happen. Long before Luther, long before Calvin, long before Zwingli, long before the Reformation, long before the Reformers were born, there were always true born-again Christians. People in the Western world, particularly places where you have a lot of Lutherans, like the Dakotas, have this misconception that the Reformers rediscovered the Gospel. In actual fact, there were people who never lost it. There were the Waldensians. In England, there were the Lollards following John Wycliffe. In Central Europe, there were the Bohemian Brethren following John Huss long before Luther. But you had the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman. And the Pope always had the political leverage to stop the spread of the gospel by persecuting these people. They controlled all education, all everything. The only Bibles were essentially Latin Vulgates, manuscripts copied by monks, and even many of the clergy, particularly the mendicants, couldn't even read it themselves. People had no concept. But something happened. Something happens. After the Renaissance, there's a change in science. Galileo comes along, Copernicus comes along, Kepler comes along, and there's a change in technology. What happens? Well, the astrolobe is invented. Magellan and Francis Drake circumvent the globe, circumnavigate the globe. And, uh, the printing press is invented by Gutenberg. So Tyndale puts the Bible into English, Luther puts it into German, and now it can be mass-produced. 
The Pope can no longer stop the spread of the gospel because there's cultural change, political change. What happens? Nationalism is born. Feudalism collapses. Capitalism is born in Europe. And people begin saying, I'm Scottish. I'm German. I'm French. I'm Swiss. Now the Pope no longer had the control of the Western world the way he once did. Then your identity as a citizen of the Holy Roman Empire was basically being a Roman Catholic. You had loyalty to a regional power who was usually a noble, and there was a loyalty to the church, and that was it. The emperor was essentially there, but it was all a confederation. That changes in the 16th century. So people like Luther come along, following somebody called Erasmus of Rotterdam, and Luther and others like him simply got away with things other people were always killed for. <laughs> Huss said the same things long before Luther. They accused Luther of agreeing with Huss, and he said, I do. When he gave his Here I Stand speech in his confrontation with John Eck, Here I Stand. Luther began, bad, uh, began right, ended badly, but began right. Well, Luther understood that he didn't rediscover the gospel. He knew there was people who never lost it. But now things change. Now the gospel is able to spread. That's an example of how it works. Right now, we've reached a time in history where the same thing has happened. The same as Western civilization went from an agricultural economy to a manufacturing economy, okay. from a feudalistic economy to a capitalistic one, now the Western world has gone from an industrial manufacturing economy to a high-tech one to a service-based economy. We're now post-communist, post-capitalist. It is a new economy, a new worldview. And once more, the challenge is there, how do we present the gospel to this new worldview? This new world can be understood as being post-modern, post-modern. Let's understand how this works. The first major time this ever happened was with the ministry of Paul. Paul the Apostle. He goes to the Greco-Roman world with the Gospel. Paul recontextualizes. He takes the same Gospel, doesn't change the meaning, he simply culturally represents it to people in a language and in a cultural framework they could understand. Paul does this. That's the first century. By the time we get to the fourth century, it changes. With political motives, Constantine pseudo-Christianizes the Roman Empire. Something goes wrong. The Church Fathers, the patristic writers, particularly the post-Nicene ones, but it even begins before that. People like Cyprian of Carthage, Ambrose of Milan, they all influence somebody called Augustine of Hippo. Well, now it's the religion of the state. Christianity has to be redefined. So Augustine, he takes a... Another approach than Paul took. Paul Platonizes Christian... Uh, Augustine of Hippo Platonizes Christianity. He turns it into a Platonic religion. He rewrites it in terms of Plato's philosophies. A lot of people think he was a great guy because he stood up against a heretic called Pelagius. He did, but he did a lot of bad things. And tragically, both Protestantism and Catholicism come from Augustine. They don't directly come from the New Testament. Well, Augustine got it wrong. He Platonized the Church. When he had the New World view, he simply rewrote Christianity as a Platonic religion. People thought they had to study Plato to understand the Bible. Happens again. The Renaissance, an Aristotelian worldview comes along and displaces a Platonic worldview, people following Aristotle. It begins in the Muslim world. When Europe was in the Dark Ages, Islam was having its Golden Age. I'm not here to offend anybody, but to state facts. If you want to know what a Roman Catholic world would look like, look at what a Roman Catholic world was like. If you want to know what the Roman Catholic Church would do in the world if it had its way, look what it did do. It had its way for 1,200 years and gave us the Dark Ages. 
That was the Roman Catholic world, the Dark Ages. Begins to end with the Renaissance, but then somebody comes along named Rambam, Maimonides, and he rewrites Judaism as an Aristotelian religion. He writes a book called Guide for the Perplexed, and Judaism becomes redefined in terms of Aristotle's philosophy. So Christendom has to get its one, and it gets somebody called Thomas Aquinas. He was an Aristotelian philosopher. The whole idea of transubstantiation comes from Aristotle's philosophy of accidents, completely debunked by modern science. For instance, in the pre-enlightenment world, they didn't make a distinction between science and the occult. With the enlightenment, they began to change. Astronomy went one way, astrology went another way. But in the ancient world, they were the same. Okay? In the post-enlightenment world, chemistry and physics went one way, alchemy and magic went the other way. <laughs> but to them it was all alchemy. Medical science and pharmacology went one way, healing arts went the other way. There was a split between science and the occult. Now one of the things you're seeing happening now in the postmodern world is a rapprochement between science and the occult. I've been warning about this for more than 15 years, maybe 18 years. You're particularly seeing it in holistic medicine, particle physics, and computer video graphic sciences. You're seeing a rapprochement between science and the occult. That's another issue I only mentioned it in passing. When they saw a chemical reaction, they didn't understand it. They thought it was magic. They didn't know about atomic covalency or about electrons shifting between shells or orbitals. They didn't know anything about ionization. They didn't know about chemical change. So they had the philosophy of accidents. Something could look like one thing but be another. <laughs> That's how they explained these chemical reactions they couldn't understand. Well, we put it, it looks like salt, it tastes like salt, but we really know it's so sodium and chlorine. It writes like a pen, looks like a pen, but actually it's a cigar. Give me a light. Or, it looks like a microphone, it works like a microphone, but it's a lollipop. <laughs> Tutti frutti, you want some? It looks like bread and wine, it tastes like bread and wine, but actually it's the protoplasm of Jesus Christ. <laughs> now today Roman Catholics will tell you we accept it by faith. They didn't accept it by faith when they invented it. They thought that's what it was chemically, you understand? Well, what does he do? He redefines Christianity as an Aristotelian religion. And in the Catholic Church, the religious orders who followed Plato were always fighting the ones who followed Augustine. The Dominicans and the Franciscans particularly hated each other. And then the, after the Reformation, the Jesuits took over. They were always against each other. But with the Reformation, it changes again. It really changes. The Reformers, you'd have to put them somewhat in the middle. They got some things right, some things wrong. But the real change begins to come to the modern world with the Industrial Revolution. It begins in England in the 18th century. Christianity is a dead middle class institution, characterized by sweatshops, child labor, and gross social injustice. In England, children as young as four were digging 16 to 18 hours a day in coal mines, dying of black lung disease and God knows what else. They were completely alienated from Christianity. Sweatshops, the only respite the working classes of England had, were getting drunk in uh, gin mills, cheap p bars, pubs, <coughs> these gin mills, and they would sing two-part vocal harmonies. That was their respite from the world in which they lived. Well. Along comes John Wesley, George Whitfield. They begin to recontextualize the gospel for the working classes. His brother Charles Wesley begins taking these two-part vocal harmonies that they were singing in the gin mills and puts Christian words to them. Same ideas. And can it be that I should... 
Oh, for a thousand tongues. They, they got these things straight out of the pub. There's the whole kind of controversy you have now about Christian rock happened back then with these gin songs. Wesley got it right. Not perfect. But John Wesley got it right. Whitfield got it right. They understood how to take the gospel and recontextualize it. Not change its meaning, just make it understandable to people who had a different way of looking at their world. But now we're at another juncture in church history. Post-industrial, post-modern, high-tech, consumer-based economy that's actually both post-capitalist and post-communist. There's a new world. What is this new world like? And how do we communicate the gospel to people with this new worldview? University campuses, particularly people under the age of 40 years old. How do you communicate the gospel to them? I've seen people try to stop the decline of Christendom in the Western world with all kinds of things. Usually hype artistry or programs. Mega churches. Do anything you need to get people in. Now understand the last time there was a revival in the United States or in the Western world, the last time there was a revival was the Jesus movement in the late 60s, early 70s, the hippies. People like myself of my generation, we did not find love and peace and things like this and taking psychedelic drugs or substance abuse or what we called free love. All we found was drug abuse and venereal disease and the rest of it. People ripping each other, up on, ripping each other off in drug deals. But there was a move of God among the hippies. Established churches didn't like the hippies. There were other people like Chuck Smith or Marsh Rosen, the founder of Jews for Jesus, who actually reached out to the hippies. That was the Jesus movement. But you see, we brought our worldview with us. We drove Lyndon Johnson out of the White House. We drove Nixon out of the White House. We went down south and we made them let black people ride the bus and vote. <laughs> it was a different world then. Black guys coming back from Vietnam uh, and they couldn't go to university in Alabama. <laughs> we had the numbers. We had the youth. We can change it. So therefore, we can take this into the church and transform society. That was the thinking. The megachurches came from this thinking initially. Now the first megachurches, like Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, they were all right. Because they did not redefine the gospel, they recontextualized it. In more recent years, the megachurches have gone away from recontextualizing the gospel, and they're redefining it based on ideas of marketing, the purpose-driven lie, secular psychology, let us understand what is happening. If the new world view is anything, the new world is instamatic, instamatic, digital photographs. It used to be, it took six weeks for a letter to reach your cousin in Western Australia. Then airmail came, took six days. Then email came, take six seconds. We want it yesterday. Instant coffee, instant communication, instant Christianity. Just get on an airplane and go to Toronto, Canada, or Lakeland, Florida, and have some tattooed goon lay hands on you and kick your grandmother in the face, and you'll be blessed and you'll have her move again. Just get deliverance. You got a problem with sin? Don't worry about picking up your cross and following Jesus. Don't worry about discipleship. Just bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. Now the term deliverance is not even used in the Bible in that sense. Bearing in mind I myself am a moderate Pentecostal. Do what I do. Not one time, not one place in the Bible, not even once, is a demon ever cast out of a born-again Christian. Christians can be demonically oppressed, but when there's an oppression, the Greek word is therapeo, healed. When there's possession, it's ekbalo, cast out. Why did the apostles never teach this? Why is there no New Testament basis for casting demons out of people who profess faith in Christ? Yes, Christians can be demonically oppressed. Paul was. 
but possessed? What I do when I see a church with a deliverance service is I go home and call them up. Good evening. Do you have a deliverance service this evening? Yes. Send over two cheeseburgers and raw onions. Don't forget the coleslaw. This is instamatic Christianity. You're not going to get spiritual by an airline ticket to Toronto, Canada to have some heretic lay hands on you. Who's getting the demons cast out this week? The same ones getting the demon cast out last week. Who's getting in line to be slain in the spirit, quote unquote, this week? The same one as last week. Weren't you just up here? Yeah, now I have a headache. <laughs> this is a lot of garbage. It's not biblical. That's not even what biblical slain in the spirit means. That's not how it happens scripturally. When you see it happening in the ministries of people like John Wesley and George Whitfield, it was unsaved people falling under the power of God and repenting of their sin. It wasn't Christians acting like jerks. Most of what you see today is hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. That's all it is. Instamatic worldview! We want an instamatic Christianity! The new worldviews, Andy Warhol said, everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes. We live in a media driven society. The electronic church. That becomes where people get their doctrine. That becomes where they pay their tithes and offerings to a con artist tele-evangelist. To some woman who's raising more money for her earrings and another facelift. She needs it. The first one didn't work. It becomes a show. It all becomes a media event. Their conferences are media events. Their TV programs are media events. It becomes so gaudy, the world makes fun of it. Believe me, the world is always going to have better rock concerts. We are called to bring the gospel into the world. We are not called to bring the world into the gospel. But Laodicea, They've got their own ideas. It's people's opinions. Instead of recontextualizing, they are redefining. If the new world views anything, it is psychologized. Now understand something. God breathed on Adam, he became a living soul. Animals have soul, but it's not immortal. They have consciousness, but no spirit. God breathed on Adam. He became a living soul, the Hebrew word Ruach. What humans made in the image and likeness of God, people, imagine Dei beings, what we are, psychologically, our consciousness, our intellect, our emotion, our minds, is a composite, a homogeneous composite of what we are organically and what we are spiritually. Mental illness never originates in the mind. When somebody doesn't play with a full deck, there's either something wrong with them chemically, or there's something wrong with them spiritually, or both. Psychology is a pseudo-science. It is non-quantitative. We can speak of neuropsychology, biopsychology, psychiatric medicine, but psychology, Jungian, the Freudian with the collective unconscious is a cult. Freudian psychology comes from his own perversions. Abraham Maslow, these people are pseudo-scientific frauds. I'll tell you what a psychologist is. Somebody who wasn't good enough at biochemistry to go to medical school and be a shrink. It becomes the humanism of man. It's the humanistic religion. That's what it is. The school system is psychologized. Media psychologized. The advertising industry is completely psychologized. It gets into the church. The church has become psychologized. If you work for a corporation, you would have been sent at some point to a sales motivational seminar. And there would have been some slick dude coming out with an expensive suit and a Benny Hinn haircut. And he'd pick up a microphone, go into a little routine. Visualize your goal. Make it the reality in your mind. Minimize the negative. 
maximize the positive. Once you make it a reality in your own mind, you will be able to make it a reality in the mind of others. You'll get those investors. You'll get that investment capital. You'll get those shareholders. You'll get that venture capital. But it begins in your mind. Every time the Dow goes through the basement, they find out the only person that worked for is the motivational speaker. <laughs> But now look, it's into the church. God has given me a vision, hallelujah, for a church that's going to see 10,000 people. Don't tell me about the unemployment in our community, how many single mothers we have on welfare in our church. I'm not interested. That's negative. I rebuke that negativity in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. What is this? Psycho babble. The purpose-driven lie is based on the motivational psychology, the marketing psychology of Peter Drucker, the late Peter Drucker, who died unsaved. Bill Gothard psychologized the youth of Christian America, or tried to. Dangerous man. Self-esteem. Self-esteem? If you're the only person who ever sinned, you're not. Or if I was the only person who ever sinned, then I'm not. But even if we were, we're not, but even if we were, God would have had to become a man and go to the cross just for us personally. If that's the value God puts on each and every one of us, Jesus didn't just die for all of us, he died for each of us. If that's the value that God of the universe puts on us, what's the self-esteem thing? The Bible doesn't teach self-esteem, it teaches diminution of self. James Dobson psychologized the women of Christian America. Influenced by his mentor, the 33rd degree Mason, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, his protege, Robert Schuller, comes along and psychologizes the pastors of Christian America. Promise keepers attempted to psychologize the men of Christian America, but it's all psychology. What is purpose driven based on? Peter Drucker. Motivational psychology, sales psychology, marketing psychology. The world is psychologized. Now how do you recontextualize the gospel for a psychologized worldview? Valid question. But instead of recontextualizing it, they are redefining Christianity as a psychological religion. The feel-good factor. Feeling has nothing to do with anything. The new worldview. Multi-faith. Multicultural society. Hence, Rick Warren says he can work with Hindus, he can work with Jews, he can work with Muslims. And they're all going to hell. There's only one gospel. God becomes a man to take our sin, to give us his righteousness. We're saved by repentance, saved by grace through faith, we're saved by regeneration, by being born again, by conviction of the Holy Spirit. That is the biblical gospel. We're not saved by sacraments, we're not saved by an ex opere operato ritual, we're not saved by works, we're not saved by atoning for our own sin in purgatory. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or do you atone for your own in purgatory. Well, if you ask Chuck Colson, he says, you can be a Catholic and believe a different gospel. How many people here used to be Catholic before you were saved? Put your hand up. See these dear people? If you want to know what Roman Catholicism is, do not listen to a deceiver like Chuck Colson. Listen to the Word of God. If an angel comes with another gospel, he is accursed. Anathanizo. No, the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. You do not atone in purgatory for your own. That man used to be a deceiver for the Nixon White House, now he's a deceiver for the Vatican. I'll debate him anytime, anywhere, as long as it's in front of a camera. The whole ecumenical agenda is a lie. Oh, all religions are the same. They all lead the same place. That is true. Hell. No religion can save anybody, only Jesus can. Satan gets more people into hell with religion than he does all the immorality, all the substance abuse, all the gambling, etc. put together. 
Let's understand what's happening in the new worldview. The new worldview, well, if the new world is anything, it is experiential. It works for me. It's all subjectivist. People don't care about objective truth anymore. It's all subjective. Experiential worldview, they want an experiential church. Now don't get me wrong, I myself believe in the gifts of the Spirit, including the charismatic gifts understood and practiced biblically. Cessationism is not a biblical doctrine. But most of what you see today is not biblical charismata. Most of what we see today is unbiblical charismania. I saw people in Toronto, Canada. I know it was God. I couldn't control it. It must have been the Lord. I know it was God. I just couldn't stop shooting. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is ikrete in Greek. Self-control, we're told that twice in the New Testament. If somebody is not in control of themselves, God's not in control of them. If an alcoholic gets saved, then he goes back out and begins hitting the bottle again, getting drunk, coming home, abusing his family and so forth, is God in control of him? No, why? Because he or she are not in control of themselves. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. By virtue of the fact they couldn't control it, biblically proves prima facie, it's not God. It can't possibly be God. It's not the Holy Spirit. At best, it's a psychological delusion. Possibly even something demonic. Experiential. And you see in this. It works for me. I feel blessed. You weren't blessed, you were deceived. Teenage girl comes from an abusive family situation. Say her old man left, left her and her mother, whatever. Never had a father figure. Her mother maybe is a substance abuser. So the kid runs away. Goes to the big city, Chicago or something like that. She meets a guy a couple of years older. He's more streetwise. <laughs> Seduces her. She felt loved by an older male. She wasn't loved. She was seduced. He didn't love her. Her? He loved him. I love me. I want you. Love is a commitment. It was pure eros. There was no real love in it. It's all experiential. You can feel whatever you want. Mormonism is based on the lie of experience. I got it burning in my bosom and I testify to you. The Church of Latter-day Saints is true. Hallelujah. I've showed them absurd things in the Book of Mormon. We have an outreach every year in Manta, Utah to the Mormons. David out there leads it. And you can show them absurd things in their own literature. They can't answer the questions, they just revert to their testimony. I've got it burning in my bosom and I testify to you, the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. That's supposed to settle everything. That becomes the absolute litmus test of what's true and false, right and wrong, how they feel about it. But they're so sincere. The most sincere person I ever saw in my life was a Buddhist monk in Saigon. Poured kerosene over his head and lit a match. You're not going to find anybody more sincere about his religion than that guy. That's the New World view. The New World is New Age. Let me take you back to my wayward youth when I was an acid-dropping, dope-smoking hippie. I'm still nuts, but for different reasons. 1968, the charismatic movement, which had roots earlier in 66, but it kicked off in 1968, the charismatic movement said it was going to spiritually transform the Western world for Christ. That's what they said. The charismatic renewal. We're going to turn the nations and the churches back to Jesus. Same year, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came to London, England. Gave a lecture, and then a series of lectures in Bangor, in the north of Wales, attended by the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and the pop icons of my generation. Lo and behold, the New Age movement was born. The New Age movement said it was going to spiritually transform the Western world. Well, that was 1968, 41 years later. Here we are, 41 years later, nearly half a lifetime later. Let me ask the question. 
Now that we're more than 40 years later, is the Western world more Christian now or is it more New Age now? It is more New Age. The only thing that has failed more miserably, more shamefully, and more inexcusably than the charismatic movement has been its leaders. Individuals may have been saved, but saved into what? Zoos with a cross on the roof they imagined to be a church? It didn't change the Western world. New Age is one. Ultimately, Christ prevails. But it's the right church, not the cycle one. New Age world, New Age church. Three times Eastern religion has invaded Western Christendom. Isaiah chapter 2 warns of this. My people are filled with influences from the East, Babylon. That's where all false religion comes from in the days of Nimrod and Semiramis. It has incipient inroads into Judaism with a person named Philo in Alexandria in the first century. But three times it invades Western Christendom. The first time is with the post-Nicene church fathers. People like Basilides, Valentinus, and above all, Oregon. They bring Eastern religion into Christendom. Christendom. Spiritualizing texts out of context, they were Gnostics. They turned Christianity into a Gnostic religion. If anybody redefined Christianity in a bad way, it was absolutely the post-Nicene Church Fathers. Second time was when the Crusades brought the spice trade from India through the Middle East back to Europe. And with it came the paganistic influences of Shia Islam and Hinduism. The counting prayer on beads, the Vishnu, the burning candles before in, uh, the graven images, the flagellation rituals in convents and monasteries. This is all copied from the Shia Muslims, the Hindus. That was the second time. This is the third time New Age has come into the church. What was the Toronto deception in Canada? What was the Pensacola deception in Florida? What was the Lakeland deception? Kundalini Yoga. I can show you people saved out of Hinduism that will show you films filmed in India of Hindus doing the same thing. It's the serpent spirit. New Age visualization. There's actually crazy people in England like Patrick Dixon writing books, altered states of consciousness or manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Totally nuts. The celebration of discipline, Richard Foster, visualization. That comes straight from, uh, from Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. An organization designed to stop the spread of the gospel after the Reformation. It is the underlying theory of Roman Catholic education. Give us a child to the age of seven, he's ours for life, even if we molest him. That's them. Where did he get this? Eastern mysticism. The, the exercises of Ignatius Loyola, copied by Joyce Huggett, copied by Richard Foster. These things are in the church big time. New Age world, you get a New Age church. Now understand, I'm talking about people who say they're born again. Liberal Protestants took Darwinism and redefined Christianity as higher criticism based on Darwinian presupposition. <laughs> But those are liberals. Those, those people don't claim to be born again. Uh, I'm talking about people who say they're saved. Anti-Semitic world. World's getting increasingly anti-Semitic. You're seeing this getting into the church. People like John Piper, the replacement theology. I'm not saying he's an anti-Semite, but he's certainly replacement theology. Replacement theology is a completely false doctrine. But let's look. What else is this new world view like? What is it like? How do people see things in our new world view? What does it like? Well, it's programmatic. Just get the right program for your software, your software program for your computer, and your hardware will do what you want it to. A programmatic world view. Get the right sales program for your church, your sales will increase. 
Get with the program, instant weight loss. Just get the program and you'll lose weight. And uh, It's a programmatic worldview. Get the program, it'll work. So people like C. Peter Wagner from Fuller Theological Cemetery will go down to Latin America and see how the Pentecostal churches are growing and say, well, if we do what they do, it'll work in Colorado, it'll work in Illinois or in the Dakotas. Forget about it being a sovereign move of God's spirit. Forget about any biblical concept. To begin with, he's not even doing that. If you go to Latin America, what happened in the Reformation in the 16th century is now happening in Latin America in the 20th, 21st century. People are turning against Roman Catholicism. They're leaving it as a false religion. These church growth people are all into the ecumenical lie. Just look at it. Get the right program! 40 days of purpose. Just say the prayer of Jabez. Nothing wrong with the prayer Jabez prayed, but they turn it into a formula incantation. <laughs> Stuff is nuts. It just doesn't work that way. God is sovereign. There are principles, like prayer, repentance, but you can't make it happen, only God can. Only He can pour out His Spirit. There are principles, but we're not following the principles. You can't manipulate God with a program, make a revival happen, but that's what they think, because that's the worldview. Just get the program. Rewrite Christianity as a programmatic religion. But of course, we live in a politically correct world. Don't offend anybody. Everything's all right. We just have to love. They have made love and truth mutually exclusive. God doesn't see it that way. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. And this I pray that your love, your agape, real love, that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. For God's love to abound, there must be knowledge of the scripture and discernment. Otherwise, you won't have love. You'll have a stupid, emotionally charged religious counterfeit, which people moronically imagine to be love. We just have to love. Where did Jesus or the apostles or the Hebrew prophets ever compromise truth for the sake of love? No, Jesus loved the woman at the well, therefore he told her the truth. Lady, your religion is no good. Salvation comes from the Jews. They've got the truth. We can't do that. Just read purpose driven. Rick Warren says, when you see a person living immorally into substance abuse, don't tell them to repent. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life. Then when he comes into their life, they'll clean him up. He's confusing justification with sanctification. Find me an evangelistic presentation in the New Testament that does not call people to repentance. Peter's charisma the day of Pentecost, the first one, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Just get Jesus in their life. Put your hand up and ask Jesus into your heart. If somebody doesn't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their heart. When I began to follow the Lord, I was shacking up with my girlfriend across the street from the UN. I was on drugs. Took the last of my drugs and threw it out the window. 20 stories down on the First Avenue in Manhattan. Good thing the Polish ambassador had diplomatic immunity. Leader of Jews for Jesus in New York said, look, you can't shack up with that broad. You've either got to get married or get out. Repentance. No, Christians don't smoke cigarettes or get drunk or take drugs. Just tell Jesus to come into your heart and he'll straighten you. If there's no repentance, he's not coming into your heart. The purpose-driven lie confuses justification with sanctification. They have to be seeker-sensitive, seeker-friendly. Why? Because we live in a politically correct world. You can't defend anybody. You can't say anything is wrong. You're right, I can't. But if the Word of God says it's wrong, that's not me. The agent of Satan Extraordinaire. La agent provocateur extraordinaire. In his last book, Tony Campolo, only quoting from it, this is what he says. 
we have the red letters and the black letters. The words of Jesus and the words of the other writers of the Bible. The red letters take precedent over the black ones, he says. No, it's all the word of God. Now let's understand something. Jesus himself in the Great Commission said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you of all, not some, all I taught you. The epistles are inspired commentary. They're the word of God, but we read the rest of the Bible through the prism of the epistles. If you want to know what Leviticus means, read Hebrews. If you want to know what the gospel means, read Romans and Galatians. If you want to understand the Olivet Discourse, read Thessalonians. We read the rest of Scripture through the prism of apostolic commentary. Jesus told the apostles, I taught you, as did John the Baptist, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to remind you what I taught you, so you'll teach them what I meant. Think of the epistles as commentary, inspired commentary. That's what Jesus taught. That's what the apostles taught. They would even say, if anyone doesn't receive what I say, have nothing to do with them, in John, 1 John, and so forth. Let them not be recognized. Mr. Compola disagrees. He says, well, Jesus never spoke against abortion. Therefore, the church shouldn't. It's not in the red letters, so it doesn't count. We don't interpret the red letters in light of the black ones. We interpret the black ones in light of the red ones. This man is from the devil. He is of those who Jesus warned would come in the last days. And his son is worse. His son says if he found things, his son Bart Campola, if he saw things about homosexuality in the Bible he didn't agree with, now don't get me wrong, I was a cocaine addict when I was in university. A homosexual or lesbian sin is no worse than my sin. Would have put me, put me in the same hell if I didn't get saved. Jesus forgave me and forgive them. I'm not putting down the people. But the sin is the sin. What the drugs were to me, that, that was their sin. Oh no, you can't say that. And he says, if I found things in the Bible, which there is in Romans 1 and in Deuteronomy and so forth, that I didn't agree with, I either ignore it or spiritualize it away. Just pick and choose. Take the bits out of the Bible you don't agree with. We have Brian McLaren, the guru of the Emergent Church. McLaren joined Rick Warren in forwarding Dan Kimball's book, The Emergent Church. Now understand these people. Their idea of restoring Christianity is not to go back to the first century. Not to the Apostolic Church or the Ephesian Age or the Book of Acts or anything like that. Then the model is the mysticism of the Dark Ages. It's the Lectio Divina. It's contemplative prayer. It's burning candles and incense before graven images. It's based on experience. It's not about truth. McLaren says, declared publicly, he's calling for the church to have a five-year moratorium on debating the subject of homosexuality and same-sex marriage. We should suspend all discussion for five years. If we don't reach our conclusion in five years, we should have another five years. Then the church should decide. If Jesus Christ, if God has decided it is Adam and Eve, by what authority can the church decide it is Adam and Steve? You know what they're saying? The emergent church people are saying the church wrote the Bible, the church can rewrite it. They are redefining Christianity. That is the whole purpose-driven lie. You go to a church and you find out, do your market research, find out what people want, then you give it to them. You might make converts, but you'll never make a disciple. And many of your converts will not even be really saved. You don't know you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. A lot of these people were never even saved. But then it goes on. The new world, the new world view, it's postmodern. Postmodernism. How do we evangelize a postmodern world? Well, we don't, they say. We redefine Christianity as a postmodern religion. This is the emergent church. Objective truth goes out the window. Objective standards of morality and holiness go out the window. Absolutes are suspended. Everything becomes relative. I feel it works for me. Don't judge. Don't criticize. I'm not. That's what God says. We'll leave those bits out. We have never gotten it more wrong. 
This is what the new worldview is like. Now, how we evangelize the new worldview, the postmodern world, that is a crucial question. And the Bible does speak of things we should be doing, but that's another subject apart from what we're talking about now. How do you evangelize an instamatic society, a media-driven society, a psychologized society, a multi-faith, multicultural society, an experiential society, a new age society, a programmatic society, a politically correct society, a postmodern world? How do we evangelize it? That is the question. But instead of looking for a biblical answer, they're going to make people's opinions. I have the right to my opinion. Laodicea, Laodicea, my people's opinions. Oh, Paul got it right. Wesley got it right. To a degree, the reformers got it right. Augustine got it wrong. Aquinas got it wrong. The post Nicene fathers got it wrong. Rick Warren got it wrong. We are getting it wrong. We are not recontextualizing the gospel of Jesus Christ for the new worldview. We are redefining it. We are rewriting it. We're doing what Aquinas did. We're doing what the post-Nicene church did. We've got it all wrong. Well, that's what Jacob Prash says. The question is, what does Jesus Christ say? Look what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. In verse 20. If you're like me, you use that evangelistically, and it's fine we do, but in its exegetical context, that's not primarily what it's talking about. He's knocking on the door of the church, not the hearts of the unsaved, even though it is not wrong to use it that way. I sometimes do that myself. But that's not mainly what it means. In its exegetical context, it means he's knocking on the door of the church of Laodicea. The church of people's opinions! If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and sup with him, he with me. He who overcomes. Laodicea. Laodicea. Laodicea, my, the church of people's opinions, and he's knocking on the door. Hey, Laodicea, it's me, Jesus. You guys are getting it wrong. You're blowing the whole thing the way the church fathers did. You're blowing the whole thing the way that Augustine did. You're blowing it the way that Aquinas did. You're really getting it wrong, Laodicea. I understand your problem, your challenge, your dilemma. But you know, I showed Paul what to do. You know, I showed the reformers what to do. I showed them. I showed John Wesley what to do, Laodicea. And if you stop running on your opinions and open the door and let me in, I will show you. I will show you, Laodicea, how to recontextualize my gospel of salvation for your world. I can show you. You're not the first, but you are going to be the last. Laodicea! It's me, Laodicea. It's Jesus. You want to let me in? Laodicea, it's Jesus. Let me in, Laodicea. Let he who has ears, let him hear. God bless. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Revelation, chapter 3, please. Commencing in verse 14. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. You do not know that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise to you to buy for me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that the disgrace to clothe yourself that the disgrace or the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed I sought to anoint your eyes that you may see those whom I love I reprove and correct be zealous therefore and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and sup with him and he with me 
He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. These seven churches that existed in Asia, what is today Turkey, in the Roman province of Asia at the end of the first century, are indeed seven literal churches. And they have a meaning for those churches at that time, <coughs> but these are seven pictures of churches that can exist at any time with specific emphasis on the last days as we lead up to the events beginning in Revelation 4.1. However, dispensationalists say, and I believe correctly, that they are four consecutive, somewhat overlapping periods of church history. That the history of the church is in the character of each church consecutively, beginning in Ephesus. The names of the churches in Greek convey something about their character spiritually. Ephesus, the apostolic church of the first century not lasting. Smyrna, the idea of myrrh, anointing for burial, the persecuted church. Pergamum, the idea of divorce. When Israel went after other gods, the idolatry was called adultery, and Yahweh gave her a bill of divorce. Hence, in the post-Nicene era, the church went into idolatry with the icons and so forth. You have the church of Thyatira, Thyatira in Greek, continuing sacrifice, the Roman doctrine of the Mass. Although we're told in Peter and in Hebrews that Jesus dies once, 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 the Roman Mass says he has to continue to die sacramentally, that is Thyatira. Then you get to the church of Sardis, from the Greek word Sarx of the flesh. Having a, a name for being alive, but are dead. Hold fast to that which you've heard. The Protestants had the truth, they heard the truth, but they never went far enough. They had a name of being alive, but are dead. And it's quite an age we live in. You just look at it. Yes, Roman Catholicism is a false religious system. But even the Roman Catholic Church, at least officially, believes in the virgin birth, believes in a literal resurrection. Although there's much pedophilia and sexual perversion among the Roman Catholic clergy, and always has been, at least officially, they won't ordain homosexuals and lesbians. It takes a Protestant to go that low. We have reached a time in history where Protestantism is more morally depraved and spiritually bankrupt than the Church of Rome. Quite a thing. So then you have Sardis, but then you have Philadelphia, the Church of Brotherly Love, corresponding to the mission movement and so forth. Again, this is a broad subject, but the last one is Laodicea. Laodicea, made of two Greek words, Leo, decayamai, laity and judgments or rights, the church of people's opinions or people's rights. I have the right to my opinion. It is a lukewarm church that mistakes material blessing as the barometer of God's favor. Laodicea was destroyed in an earthquake historically and didn't need any assistance from the imperial authorities of Rome to rebuild. We have need of nothing. They made money the barometer of blessing. Laodicea's big problem, however, is not simply that it is lukewarm and materialistic. Its big problem is it doesn't know it's Laodicea. Buy sob to anoint your eyes that you may see. Laodicea's first problem is it doesn't know that's who it is. The church of the Western world today, the so-called evangelical church, does not understand that it is a church that is lukewarm, that it is a church that is materialistic, and that it is a church that is blind to its own true spiritual state. A church of people's opinions. Leo decayamai. People's opinions. I'd like to talk to you today about something called worldviews. Whenever you have a change in things like economy or politics, you'll have changes in technology and economics. That brings about cultural changes. And it always presents a challenge for the church because there's a new worldview. There's a new worldview. There are two terms I'd like to introduce into this presentation. You may have heard them, you probably have. Recontextualize and redefine. Recontextualization and redefinition. When you take the unchanging truths of God's Word, when you take the Gospel, the unchanging Gospel, and you repackage it culturally, to make it understandable to people with a different culture or worldview, you're simply recontextualizing it. For instance, there was a time in the late 1950s when the Wycliffe Bible translators went to a tribe in equatorial Africa who never saw snow. They were hundreds of miles from Mount Kilimanjaro, didn't know what snow was, that would have been the nearest place. 
And so when the missionaries came, they translated Isaiah 118, your sins shall be white as snow. They translated it, your sins shall be white as coconut. They didn't change the meaning. They simply recontextualized it until they could show people pictures of Mount Kilimanjaro and show them what snow was. It is perfectly biblical to recontextualize a message. We looked at this yesterday. Paul took Isaiah 59 and he recontextualized the Jewish armor using a Roman legionnaire's armor. When you recontextualize, you don't change the meaning. You simply put the parcel in a new box that the people can open within their culture. But then there's redefinition. It is when you change the meaning. Whenever you have a new worldview situation, the church will either recontextualize or redefine. When Paul and Barnabas first were sent out by the Holy Spirit from Antioch to bring the gospel to the Greco-Roman world, they were dealing with people who had a different worldview. Greeks thought differently philosophically. They didn't think the way the Hebrews did. The first believers were Jewish. They saw things one way and in one light. But now they went to the Greco-Roman world. What Paul did was what we saw yesterday. He takes the Jewish armor, puts it into a Roman legionnaire's armor. He takes the Jewish Passover, he puts it into a language in 1 Corinthians, the Gentiles could understand it. Paul knew how, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how to recontextualize. He never changed the gospel, he never redefined it, he simply recontextualized it. He put it into a different cultural package so people with a different worldview could understand it. But then time goes on and it changes again. Pretty soon it becomes more Greeks and Romans than Jews in the church. Constantine pseudo-Christianizes the Roman Empire. Somebody else comes along and does not recontextualize the gospel now, he redefines it. Begins spiritualizing things out of it he didn't like or that presented a problem because they needed a new theology, a new form of Christianity, now that it was the official religion of the Roman Empire, when Constantine saw Christianity as a way to hold together the crumbling Roman Empire. This man was Augustine of Hippo. If you really want to understand John Calvin and where Calvinism comes from, begin by reading Augustine. Augustine was influenced by people like Cyprian of Carthage and Ambrose of Milan, the church fathers. And then the post-Nicene fathers went even further. They rewrote Christianity as a Platonic religion using Plato's philosophy. They didn't recontextualize, they redefined it. Church fathers completely changed everything in many fundamental respects. But Augustine was the most pivotal in the West. He was a Platonist. But then you get to the Renaissance and there's a rebirth of Aristotelian philosophy. People begin thinking in terms of Aristotle's philosophy. The whole doctrine of the accidents of the mass, the accidents. Something can be one thing chemically, but its appearances are merely its accidents. That's how Thomas Aquinas explained the heresy of transubstantiation. It's complete nonsense. Total foolishness. It may look like a microphone, but that's only its appearances. It's actually an ice cream cone. Tutti frutti, you want some. It may look like a pencil. It may write like a pencil, but actually it's a cigarette. Give me a light. They didn't understand about atomic number. They didn't understand about electrons shifting between orbitals. They didn't understand the difference between chemical change and physical change. Now this is obviously all debunked by modern chemistry and physics, but the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation is based on something debunked, Aristotle's philosophy of accidents. Oh, it looks like bread, it looks like wine, but it's actually the protoplasmic Jesus Christ. It's human protoplasm of Jesus that's divinely imbued. Officially, tell, unofficially, a Roman Catholic will tell you, oh, we believe it by faith. Originally, they didn't believe it by faith. They thought that's what it was chemically. What happens? Aquinas rewrites Christianity as an Aristotelian religion. Much the same as a rabbi named Maimonides, Rambam, rewrote Judaism as an Aristotelian religion. He wrote something called a guide for the perplexed, 
So the Jews would rewrite Judaism as an Aristotelian religion. Thomas Aquinas wrote the Summa Theologia. But by now we're no longer talking about Christianity. From Constantine onward you have something called Christendom, better called Christendom. They simply redefine. We get to the Reformation and the birth of humanism. There were other people who go back under the influence of humanist scholarship, particularly people like Erasmus. And Luther was inspired by somebody called Lefevre, a French humanist, who could read Greek. And he told Luther the word metanoia in Greek means to repent, not the sacrament of penance. Luther realizes the whole Roman Catholic thing was a joke and a con. Simply go back to the original languages. Reformation happens, and you have people like William Tyndale begin to put the word of God into English. They re contextualize. At the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, it happens again. The church is a dead middle class institution in England. Industrialism begins in Britain. People don't go to church. Social injustice plagues everybody. You had children as young as four dealing, digging in coal mines 16, 18 hours a day. The working classes labored in sweatshops six days a week, sometimes seven. Grueling hours up to 18 hours a day. Their only respite was getting drunk in cheap gin and gin mills. And they would sing two-part vocal harmonies when they were stoned on cheap gin. Into this environment comes John Wesley, his brother Charles, and George Whitfield. Charles Wesley takes these two-part vocal harmonies and puts Christian words to them. And George Whitfield and John Wesley begin preaching the gospel in the mining towns and the factory towns of England. Revival came was exported to America. They recontextualized. They found a way to make the gospel relevant to a working class factory culture. Some people have gotten it right, some got it wrong. When we get to the 20th century, we have Darwinism going full steam. Lo and behold, higher criticism. Everything evolves, so the Bible must have evolved. Along comes Rudolf Bultmann. The liberal higher critics, they rewrite Christendom as a Darwinistic religion. These are simply moral philosophies, ancient myths designed to teach moral principles. Nobody can believe in God in the age of an electric light, wrote Boltman. These texts evolved along a Darwinistic model of synthesis, antithesis, thesis. Purely Hegelian dialectics. That's all it was. They rewrote Christianity as a Hegelian Darwinistic religion. That's liberal higher criticism. Once again, we've reached a time where the worldview has changed. In John Wesley's day, the world went from a manufacturing economy to an uh, from an agricultural economy to a manufacturing one. People no longer made their living, by and large, in agriculture. Most people worked in factories. Well, now it's happened again. Steel is no longer made in Pittsburgh unless it's made by a robot. Cars being made in Detroit are made by robots. The Great Plains of America, you know better than I, are being depopulated. Farming has become so efficient you need less and less people. What is happening? We are going from a manufacturing, we've gone from a manufacturing economy to a high-tech economy. People are displaced. You don't need armature winders anymore. You don't need as many tool and die makers. That stuff is done by computer design. Labor intensive jobs are either done by illegal immigrants or they're exported to the third world. Now it's a high tech economy. Everything is done online. That's the future. We have a new worldview. How do you recontextualize the gospel for the new worldview? The problem is, we are not recontextualizing it, we are redefining it, and I mean evangelicals. We're not doing what Paul did, or what Wesley did, or what Whitfield did, or what Tyndale did. We're doing what Boltman did. We're doing what Aquinas did. We're doing what Augustine did. We are reinventing Christianity. That is the whole purpose-driven agenda. That is the whole emergent church agenda. Let's understand the new worldview. This new worldview, if it's anything, is a consumerist society. Not focused on production, but on consumerism. On consumption. 
Here in the United States, you have television stations and channels with no programming, only commercials. They show you one commercial after another. Quick, dial now. 1-800-J-E-R-K. This piece of junk can be yours. And as an added bonus, we'll throw in another piece of junk. Dial now. Give us your visa number. Give us your American Express number. Call now. Then there's another commercial. This is a consumerist society. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. Now, how do you evangelize people who have a consumerist worldview? whose way of thinking has been framed by the advertising media from Madison Avenue? That is a good question. It is a challenging question. Only instead of recontextualizing the gospel for a consumerist worldview, they have redefined it as a consumerist religion. Name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, Kenny and Benny, this can be yours. Just confess it. The word faith formula. What are they doing? They are redefining Christianity on the basis of consumerism. In a consumer-driven society, everything is the sales program. Get the right program. You see, this society, this new worldview, is programmatic. Get the right software package for your computer, and your hardware will do what you want. Get Windows, Excel, get whatever. Just get the right program, get the right sales program, you'll grow. Get the right program for your church, it'll grow. 40 days of purpose, 40... It's all programmatic. Of course, it doesn't work. It rules the sovereignty of God out of the equation. Its precepts are generally unbiblical, but just get the program because we live in a programmatic society. Hence, they make Christianity a programmatic religion. Take an alpha course in England, and America gets you 40 days. This new worldview is... a uh, Instamatic one. We won it yesterday. It used to be you wrote a letter to your cousin in Singapore. It took three weeks to get there by ship. They take it by train from Fargo to San Francisco, put it on a ship. Three weeks or a month later, your cousin in Singapore would have the letter. Then came airmail. He has it within a week. Then comes fax machines. He has it within three minutes. Now with email, he has it within three seconds. This is the instamatic society in which we live. We want it yesterday. We want it instantly. People did not get to be the basket cases they are when they first get saved overnight. It takes years. Somehow discipleship is supposed to be instamatic. Salvation is instant. He who believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth, you repent of your sin and ask Jesus to come into your life, you'll be born again. That's instamatic. But discipleship? That's not instamatic. That takes time. It's a growing process. But no, we want a fast route to spirituality because we have an instamatic worldview. Therefore, let's see, how do we deal with this? I know, instead of learning to pick up my cross and deal with my problem, I'll get deliverance. I'll go to a deliverance minister. He'll cast the demons out of me, then I'll be spiritual. The Greek word for casting out a demon is ekbalo. Not one time, not one place in the New Testament is it ever used in connection with the saved Christian. Never. Christians can be demonically oppressed. Paul was. But when people are oppressed by demons, the word is therapeo in Greek. Therapy healed. They're healed of it. Ekbala was possession. Not one time, not one place does the New Testament ever teach casting a demon out of a believer. But that's what they're doing. Just go get the demon. Who's getting the demon cast out this week? Same one as last week. Always the same people. Did their lives change? No. They get more and more loony. Do what I do. You see a church with a deliverance service, pick up the phone. Good evening. You have a deliverance service tonight? Good. Send over two cheeseburgers with raw onions. Don't forget the coleslaw. It's a racket. The apostles never taught it. And all the instructions they give for dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil, they never caught, taught casting demons out of believers. It puts people into spiritual bondage and psychological bondage.
It doesn't set them free. It makes them more bound. Why doesn't it work? Because we have an instamatic society. How do we get spiritual? How do we get revival? How do we get the power of God? Simple. Buy an airplane ticket, go to Toronto, Canada, or Pensacola, Florida, and it'll happen for you. Instant. What about repentance? What about prayer? What about asking God to forgive us for the mess we made out of the church? What about asking Him to pour out His Spirit upon us and bringing conviction to the lost? Oh no, that takes time. That takes effort. It's easier to go to Toronto or Pensacola or wherever the latest nonsense is. Instamatic society, instamatic worldview, we want an instamatic church. They are redefining Christianity as an instamatic religion. As we've been hearing repeatedly from Dave Hunt and other speakers, if the new worldview is anything, it's driven by psychology. Psychology. Now understand the nature of psychology, it's rooted in Darwinism and in Eastern religion. Biblically, we are tripartite, we are three-dimensional. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Know ye not your temple of the Holy Spirit? It's like three. The body in Greek is soma, Hebrew goof. The spirit in Greek is psuche, get psychology, in Hebrew nephesh. But the innermost man or woman, the spirit in Hebrew is ruach, pneuma in Greek. We're three-dimensional. Psychology says we are two-dimensional. Psychology, be it the Freudian, the Jungian, or otherwise, says we are simply apes with better DNA. Carl Jung saw a spiritual dimension of man, but it was based on the occult, the collective unconscious. It was just part of the mind. Psychology and Eastern religion go hand in hand. Eastern religion says the same thing. The Korean heretic, Young Yi Chao, wrote a book, The Fourth Dimension. Now, people in the West are impressed with him because of the size of his church. Believe me, I've been to Asia many times. There are far bigger visualization cults in Asia than his. Only people in the West are impressed by that deceiver. Whether he's a Christian or not, I don't know, but I know what he wrote in his book. Your subconscious imagination is your spirit. Visualize what you want and speak it into faith by being. This is Oriental shamanism. He actually wrote in the book, Hindus and Buddhists have known this for centuries. Now Jesus Christ has shown it to him. Don't get me wrong, I am not Young Yi Chao's judge. I do not know if he's a Christian or not, but I know he's a Buddhist. I know he's a Hindu. Whether or not he's a Christian, I couldn't tell you. But I do know he's a Hindu and a Buddhist. Eastern religion and secular psychology make people two-dimensional. We're three-dimensional. Mental illness never originates in the mind. If somebody is loopy, there's either something wrong with them organically, physically, medically, or there's something wrong with them spiritually, or both. But mental illness never comes from the mind. God breathed on Adam, and he became a living soul. What people are psychologically is a homogenous combination of what we are physiologically and what we are spiritually. Mental illness doesn't come from the mind. Biopsychology, neuropsychology, psychiatric medicine at least deal with the organic aspects of human behavior. They have at least a scientific basis. Psychology is pseudoscience. It's non-quantitative. It's not even real science. And it's not real theology. All it is is the abject religion of man. Now there is biblical psychology. If you want to understand human behavior, read the book of Proverbs. That's biblical psychology. If you want to know why people are the way they are, read Proverbs. What we are psychologically is a product of what we are spiritually and organically. Read Proverbs. You have a copy of Young Freud or a textbook from Fuller Theological Cemetery, put a match to it. Yet it's psychologized. The school system psychologized. The military is psychologized. Marketing and advertising are psychologized. If you work for a corporation, without doubt, you have been sent to a motivational sales seminar by your corporation. I'll tell you how it works. You get some guy coming out with an expensive suit and a Benny Hinn haircut, and he charges you $350 to go down to the Holiday Inn. 
And he says something like this. Visualize your goal. Maximize the positive. Minimize the negative. Make it a reality in your mind. Picture it, visualize it. Once you've made it a reality in your mind, you will make it a reality in the mind of others. You'll get that capital investment. You'll get those people who have that money you need as shareholders. You'll get that venture capital. But it begins here. Now every time the Dow goes through the basement, they find out the only one that works for is of course the motivational speaker. Nonetheless, that's the way the game is played. This gets into the church. The Lord has given me a vision for a church going to hold 10,000 people, hallelujah. It's going to cost us $26.4 million. Don't tell me about the unemployment in our community and how many single mothers we have in the church now. That's negative. I don't receive it in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. You understand what they're doing? Dave was right. It came from Norman Vincent Peale via Robert Schuller. And it is the first foundation of Purpose Driven. This is the psycho babble. That's all it is. Psychologized worldview, psychologize the church. It's simply motivational psychology using Christian jargon. That's it. They are redefining Christianity as a psychologized religion, as an instamatic religion, as an anything religion, except a biblical one. But let's understand this further. The Bible says the solution to past hurts is the cross. Reckon yourself dead. They put people in bondage to things that perpetuate the old creation. Now, I know people who became Christians and they were so destroyed by alcohol, they had to go through something to get them off alcohol before they were witnessable. I know other people in hell because of Alcoholics Anonymous. It is so good at mimicking the Bible in certain respects. I don't need that. I have this. Twelve steps of death. Hello? My name is Alex. Hi, Alex! And I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hello, my name is Hazel. Hi, Hazel. And I'm a recovering compulsive gambler. My name is Jacob. And I'm not a recovering cocaine addict from the east side of New York. That poor loser is dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. <laughs> Their fellowship becomes based on the old sin instead of on the new creation. Biblically, that abused child, that sexually abused child, they're dead. Reckon yourself dead. Take it into account that they're dead. That's what the Greek means. No, no. Get a shovel. Dig up the corpse and live in it. We have to have some inner healing. Ruth Carter Stapleton. You know what that junk was? It is primal therapy. Basically formulated by Dr. Arthur Janov in Los Angeles, popularized by John Lennon of the Beatles. You've got to go back and relive your past hurt to become liberated from it. It's simply primal therapy. Regression. Get the shovel, go to the cemetery and dig up the old creation. The new worldview, the new society, the new economy is media driven. It's all a show. He was in some human sense a social prophet, the pop artist Andy Warhol. Originally from Pittsburgh, came to fame in my hometown of New York. He realized what was going to happen. He said, because of the internet and because of the way media is going to go, in the future everybody would be famous for 15 minutes. When people were singing about hippies and love and peace and then the war in Vietnam and all this stuff, he said, 10, 12 years from now this won't matter. People won't care about truth, they'll care about experience. Experience will be the vindicator. Experience will be the way that you have a litmus test to see if something is good or bad, right or wrong. It works for me, thanks. It's all media driven, it'll be a show. Turn on the idiot box. Turn on TBN. For about 
30 seconds after that you become nauseated. It's so worldly, the world makes fun of it. Unsaved people see right through those con artists, money preachers. Unsaved people see right through Jim and Tommy and Tenny and Benny and, and Kraut. They, they, unsaved people see right through them. The only thing they've done is make born again a household joke. They've discredited the gospel and the church of Jesus Christ. We would be better off with no Christian TV than 95, if not 99 percent of what we've had. Anything that powerful Satan had to get control of, and he sure did. Pat Robinson is but one agent of deception. It's a media show. You've got to entertain people. Only if they don't understand the Word of God. If they understand the Word of God, you don't have to entertain them with the world's methods. The world will always have better rock concerts. If I wanted a rock concert, so happens I don't, but if I did, I would go see Pink Floyd or Rolling Stones or whoever. I don't want to come to church for a rock concert. The world will always do it better. The world will always have better entertainment. The world will always do it better. We're not called to compete with the world on the world's terms or to be like the world. We're called to be in it, but not of it. They will always do it better. So what do they do? The electronic church. There's people who get their doctrine from a heretic on the idiot box. They pay their tithes to the idiot box. That's their church. The idiot box. That's where they give their money. And lots of it. Media-driven society, media-driven church. Leo de KMI, people's opinions. It works for me, thanks. It's all subjective. In England, they have these home Bible study groups where there's no leader. They just discuss the passage. This is what it means to me. This is what it means to me. You assign your own meanings without any reference to the exegetical meaning of the text, what the Holy Spirit inspired it to say. It works for me, thanks. No, it doesn't work for you. You're deluded. No objectivity anymore. Brian McLaren, the heretic pioneer guru of the emergent church said, Christianity is not based on propositional truth. Never was. He's a liar. He's an absolute liar. Propositional truth is a true or false statement. It is propositionally true that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul says, if the historicity of the resurrection of Christ is not propositionally true, we are the most foolish of all men for believing it. We should be down in Clancy's saloon, getting drunk. We should be on the next plane to Vegas. We should be doing what the world does. We should be out, eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we'll be buried. We should be out getting stoned, whoring around. We should be doing everything the world does. We're stupid for not whoring around and getting stoned and going to Vegas and whatever. If Christ is not risen. But he is risen, hallelujah. It is a propositional truth. But because we have an experiential society with no propositional truth, with no absolutes, relativism gone mad. You have a relativism in the church. They have redefined Christianity as a relativistic religion. It's called the emergent church. It's about experience. It's relational. It's not propositional and factual. It's all subjective. It's not objective. And the purpose-driven lie, you let the people define the need. It's based on marketing, Peter Drucker. Find out what the need of the market is, what the demand is, and give them the product. Well, the Word of God defines people's need. It's salvation. No, no, you let them define the need. They have rewritten the gospel. They have redefined Christianity as a programmatic religion, a consumerist religion, a psychologized religion an instamatic religion and a media-driven religion as an experiential religion, but there's more to it than that. The new world is multi-ethnic, multi-faith. Jesus came through a Jewish culture. He came to his own, we're told in John 1.12. The apostles said, we don't try to put Jewish culture on Gentiles, they just have to understand the theology of it. It's for all people, for all cultures. 
it's good to understand, in fact, it's necessary to understand the Jewish background, to understand it properly doctrinally, but you don't try to put Jewish culture on people. My family are Israeli, we keep the Sabbath on Saturday, and we go to church on Sunday, but we never put that on somebody else. However, the church you have today says, we have a multi-faith society, we need a multi-faith church. Roger showed pictures of Peter Kreef's book, Ecumenical Jihad. That book says we should have ecumenical unity with Islam to save society. We should have ecumenical union with Islam to morally save society. Islam says God has no son. Who endorsed that book? J.I. Packer, the Calvinist theologian, and Chuck Colson, who used to be a liar and a deceiver for Nixon, now he's a liar and a deceiver for the ecumenical movement. Ecumenical union with Islam? These are major Christian leaders. Once again in Davos, Switzerland, Rick Warren says, the future of the world is religious pluralism. He spoke at a synagogue about three or four months ago in North California, at a conference of rabbis. The Union of American Rabbis did not mention Jesus Christ once. Can you imagine Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, speaking to his fellow rabbis and not presenting the gospel, Yeshua, as the way of salvation? No, Paul wouldn't do that. Rick Warren did do it. You don't need Christ. We have a multi-faith society. Therefore, we'll have a multi-faith religion. But once again, if this new age is anything, it is new age. There's always a problem when you deal with new age because it's Gnosticism. A subjective mystical revelation. And whenever you deal with any kind of Gnostic, such as a new ager, they will use the same terms we do, but mean something different by them. I believe in being born again, so do they, reincarnation. I saw the light. You're thinking John chapter 1, the true light that came into the world. They're thinking the light. I saw the light too, the cosmic illumination of the inner self. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Oh, we believe in the Holy Spirit. To them it's the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. The age of Aquarius or whatever it is. They will use the same terms we do, but mean something different by them. I believe this sin. Oh, so do they. That's giving place to negative vibes. I witness to the New Ages in Maui all the time. And Roman Catholicism, their form of Gnosticism, is called the census plenier. You can have a theological forum where the Protestants, so-called, will say, we're saved by grace. And the Jesuit will say, yes, we're saved by grace. Oh, the Reformation was a mistake. Let's shake hands and pretend the whole thing never happened. We all agree we're saved by grace. Two different definitions of grace. In English, it means undeserved favor. In Hebrew, the word is chesed, God's mercy in the covenant. In Greek, the word is charism, a gift. So the evangelical is thinking gift, undeserved, unmerited. Mercy. To a Catholic grace is an ethereal substance earned by the sacraments. <laughs> Yeah, we're saved by grace. Two different definitions of grace. Mormons believe in Jesus. Yeah, it's a different Jesus. You can always agree by using the same terms as long as you mean something different by them. But push that out of the way like Ravi Zacharias does. So we can have unity. New age. What was Toronto and Pensacola? Ask Tom Chaco, who's an evangelist of Hindus, who was a Hindu. He'll tell you what it is. Kundalini Yoga. That's all. That's all. New Age Society. Redefine Christianity as a New Age religion. Experiential Society. Redefine Christianity as an experiential faith. Redefine it. Media-driven society, redefine Christianity as a media-driven faith, or an instamatic one, or a multi-faith one, or a psychologized one, or a programmatic one, or a consumerist one, or an anything one except a biblical one. 
we have gotten it wrong and we are getting it more wrong and purpose driven and the emergent church more so is taking us to the depths of absolute depravity and departure from any form of biblical evangelicism. If we are not on the threshold of the great apostasy, I don't know what is the great apostasy. You see, Paul got it right. When he went to the Greco-Roman world, he knew how to recontextualize. He didn't read the fine. During the Reformation, William Tyndale, he knew how to recontextualize. Cost him his life, but he did it. He didn't read the fine. John Wesley, George Whitfield, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, they knew how to recontextualize. They did not read the fine. But we have gone the way of the post-Nicene patristic writers, the so-called church fathers. They're not my father. We've gone the way of Augustine, Aquinas, and Boltman. The way of Copeland, Hagen, and Hinn. We are redefining Christianity. We have redefined the church. Based on people's opinions, people's ideas. Well, I have the right to my opinion. Yeah, you do. That's what Laodicea means. Leo Laodiceamai. Now, there is a place for people's opinions. But they must always be subordinated to the Word of God. Very briefly, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look what Paul says. Verse 6. But this I say by way of concession, not command. Verse 10. But to the married I give instruction. Not I, but the Lord. This is what Paul says, but this is what God says. Verse 12, but to the rest I say, I say, not the Lord. <laughs> Notice how careful Paul is. This is doctrine, this is my opinion. Now I'm not saying those verses are not canonical. The Holy Spirit inspired them to be put in the Word of God. I'm not saying they don't have doctrinal import. They do, but the doctrine they teach is our opinions are not a basis of doctrine. <laughs> Even Paul and the rest of us are not as spiritual as he was. Even Paul, an apostle, was very careful about introducing his own opinions. I believe I have wisdom from the Lord. This is my sanctified opinion. But this is saying the Lord. But now I think this. Paul was that careful. Today, people's opinions are not being subordinated to the Lord or to the Word of the Lord. They are predominating. They are eclipsing. They are usurping the Word of the Lord. Now again, I point out those verses are canonical. Paul was inspired to write them. They're in the Word of God, but they're there to teach us the doctrine that our opinion is not a basis of doctrine. Even though he gives good advice. People's opinions. Laodicea, you see, Laodicea, if you're like me, you usually use the message to that church in witnessing and evangelism. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You usually use that verse evangelistically, and it's fine we do. I do it myself. I guess most Christians who witness do. I'm not saying it's wrong. But in its exegetical context, that's not its primary meaning. He's knocking on the door of a church. He's outside. Jesus is outside of the church of Laodicea. He's outside of Saddle Brook. He's outside of Willow Creek. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a Ken Blanchard in their pulpit. They wouldn't have a Muslim in their pulpit. Shula wouldn't have had the Mufti of Damascus in his pulpit explaining Islam and Shula saying if his grandchildren became Muslims, it wouldn't bother him. It will in eternity. Jesus is outside. He's outside knocking, trying to get in. Yes, it's a new worldview. It's a new challenge. The demands are formidable. How do we recontextualize the gospel of Jesus for a new worldview, for a high-tech society driven by media? How, in the age of internet, do we evangelize? That is a question. But we are not recontextualizing. We are redefining. We're making the errors of Boltman, 
of Augustine, of Aquinas, and Jesus is knocking. He's out there knocking, trying to get in. Hey, Laodicea, hey, church of people's opinions, you're getting it wrong. It's your opinion. Why don't you listen to me? I, I know what you're doing. Listen, I can show you how to handle this. Now, what you're doing is never going to work. Let me show you what's going to work. You know, I showed William Tyndale what to do when he faced this challenge. You know, I showed John Wesley what to do. You know, I showed George Whitfield how to handle this kind of situation. You know, I showed the Apostle Paul what to do. I showed them what to do, Laodicea. But you're getting it wrong. If you let me in, I'll show you what to do. It's me, Jesus, Laodicea. Let me in, Laodicea. I'll show you how to handle this, Laodicea. I'll show you how to evangelize a post-Christian, neo-pagan, Western world, Laodicea. I'll show you how to reach the high-tech age. I'll show you how to reach these people, Laodicea. But you're running on your opinions. You think I can't show you? I showed Tyndale. I showed Wesley. I showed Paul. Let me in, Laodicea. It's me, Laodicea. Let me in. Let he who has ears, let him hear. God bless.